Riding those two cars as well. Of course, it's pretty fair to say that they don't drive them quite as hard as what they did in a day. They couldn't afford the upkeep on them if they did. Well, but it'd, be, <laughs> it'd be stratospheric, wouldn't it? Yeah, we imagine, um, I believe at the time the Sierras were uh, an engine rebuild after every race and about four races for a, a Commodore slash Walkinshaw car to be rebuilt. So, And then we see two more. That's the uh, Bluebird.
this is really great to see some of these cars and all of these uh, Holdens and Fords that you're seeing on the track have all got a history of racing at Bathurst and, and quite a few with different uh, drivers that have been involved. So at the moment, the Orcon car that we're looking at out the front there has uh, an, an incredible build there and also some very interesting drivers that have been involved. Number 20, I think if you look at these cars, we're talking about between 2000 and 2005, or there was 99 there, but we can see that this car at the front, the Deco Road car, it is the Winterbottom and Barguana car. And that vehicle, uh, 2005, I think it was, that was uh, very well raced, but it was also built in uh, the uh, the Larkham uh, area. So... Yeah, I thought that was a, a Mark, Mark Larkham, Larkham car. car. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. the Orcon still and Mark Larkham had a, had a team car as well. Now we look at Mark Larkham and he is a, a great commentator with a lot of technical information. But back then, building and running a team of cars and racing at the same time and doing an awesome job. The car that's second on the track is actually a car that was raced by John Bow. And it even has his name on it. I know, and it's amazing. But uh, we think about the, the Caterpillar sponsorship, and this was after the Dick Johnson years, uh, a car that raced at Bathurst as well, and I believe that that car was also raced by Barguana previously. One of the things I love about John Bauer is that now he's not in this main game. He'll turn up at almost any historic meeting and drive whatever car's offered to him, and not necessarily the fastest car out there. I mean, he, he drives a lot of Joe Collage's cars, but one year he drove a Hilly 3000 simply because nobody else had offered him a car. And uh, the owner said, would you like to ha have a steer of this at the, at the minute? He said, yeah, great, fantastic. Give me a car, I'll drive it. Well, John's not only that way, but uh, the other thing about John is that he will give anything a chance. So he's raced a, a Corvette at Monterey in the US. Yep. He's uh, certainly raced Formula 5000s. Prior to being in touring cars, he was very famous overseas. In fact, it was the event in 1980 at uh, Calder Park at the Grand Prix where John said, yeah, I'll give this HDT race of champions a go. Nobody knew him, and then he got picked up by Dick Johnson a few years later. But he's even driven a, a Volvo too. Yeah, well, why not? <laughs> Say no more. Now, we're looking at uh, Ron Goodman taking an opportunity to give that uh, Porsche a little bit of a rev out there, and the sound of a two-litre engine is still spectacular. The two-litre Porsche F Flat 6 is a fantastic-sounding engine. It was, it was the sound and look of those things at full noise that drew me to the Porsche mark back in oh, the late 60s. Um, I, I fell in love with the Chesterfield racing car that Foley was racing, and I've never quite uh, been able to shake that neurotic uh, association with the Porsche mark. That's a beautiful car, beautiful, beautiful car. And uh, left-hand drive, gullwing doors. We've got one going very slowly up on the, the left-hand side. There we've got a yellow flag out. Just a, It is a parade lap, but they're still going at some speed. So it's uh, take it carefully. But Ron, if, not only does he uh, put this car out and make it look good, but it's also absolutely spectacular to, to see that he has fun with these cars. Now, now some... What's happened here? Well, this, this is a display lap. Yeah, this is just a display lap, but it looks like uh, the car that is the Reco Valvoline number 34 has said, you know what, I really don't like those uh, witches' hats. I'm going to see how close I can get to them. But that car is actually a car that was raced by Tanda as uh, part of the GRM fold, uh, the Gary Rogers Motorsport right. fold. And uh, spectacular to see that one out there, 99-2000, that car was at Bathurst. And there we go, the, the Seton XR8. Yeah, the Seton XR8. Now, this was Seton and Crompton. And uh, the two of them did very well in that car. And, of course, it's uh, also had a series of races that it's been involved with all over the country. A, a spectacular Falcon that uh, you wish... It could have done better. You wish that Seaton could have won Bathurst. But even back then, when Seaton was uh, getting the Ford Credit sponsorship, you can see the number one on the side, which is that was the championship winning car. Yep, he won the championship but never won Bathurst. It was yep. just uh, one of those strange things. I mean, he, just, he was so close to winning it one year. And yet, you know, what is really great to see is that 
Bo Seaton, Glenn Seaton, and now the son as well, Aaron Seaton. Uh, Aaron is doing really well and looking to get a seat in V8 Supercar or in the Supercar Series. Uh, it'll be great to see him out there doing as well as he can. Multi generation family involved in motorsport. Well, all over the world you see that. I mean, we've even had uh, a father and son pairing of world championships more than once, champions more than once now. And young Matthew Brabham is doing very well internationally with the Indy Lights. How's, uh, how's he for height? Not as tall as his father. Okay, because that's a problem. If, you, if you're too tall, um, F1 is almost, uh, al- almost beyond reach before you even put your bum in the seat of a car. He's certainly a talent behind the wheel, and, and this is a day which celebrates that talent. And when we talk about families or whether we talk about individuals, uh, look, at, look at Winterbottom. I mean, what a great talent Winterbottom still is today working with Charlie Schwerkold in the Supercar Series, absolutely kicking butt. And Bargwana, uh, we're talking there that Bargwana is still actively involved in the scene as well. Now, a car that's just hit the screen, I do want to talk about. This car was originally the colour scan car, and it was converted in by Bob Forbes to be the car that is called the Green Eyed Meanie. And, and this was the car that Craig Lowndes first started driving a Ford with. Now, it's 00 Motorsport, which was also then Forbes into Gibson. But uh, what we're talking about is a car that Craig Lowndes raced. He didn't do as well as he wanted to. Uh, Crompton was involved with this as well. But the 00 referred to something that followed Peter Brock. We know that Craig Lowndes followed Peter Brock in a lot of ways. But with the 05 that Brocky was really known for, the 00 was saying any P-platers need to have a zero alcohol rating if they are to drive their vehicles. And that's what he promoted, similar to Peter in promoting the .05. Craig promoted the double zero. And the car itself, you can see the Gibson uh, on the back there, on the back right hand, uh, or back, back guards there. Absolutely spectacular. And with those green eyes, and if it was coming into an afternoon race... Looked fantastic, oh, didn't it? Oh, just, just looked amazing. Fantastic. But it's great to see this because also, with this being ARDC 70, the ARDC, 7, uh, ARDC was so intimately involved with the race at Bathurst. Mm. And, and this well, they take, had the track. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this just takes you to the, to the cream of the, of the, of the, the, the V8... Uh, pre-V8 supercar era. Is this a supercar? Or this is, is a, supercar. a supercar. So these are early supercars. And again, if you want to see these, the guys have got them all set up in garages one, I think one, two, three, four, uh, just down at the pits. They're more than happy to talk about the history of the cars, the way that they are actually looking after them, and the big smiles on their faces for the fact that yesterday they didn't get a chance to go out and do parade laps. So hear the ability to see these cars, hear them on the track. How good is this, John? Absolutely fantastic. We've just seen Bauer pass. The Bauer car passed on the line. Wouldn't have happened if JB was there. <laughs> Definitely not. And, and it's interesting when we talk about a talent like Craig Lowndes, we do remember that uh, I think it was the 94 race where he came around the side of Bauer. So here comes Ron now onto the main straight. Lights blazing and the sound of that Porsche coming down the main straightaway. This is something you don't hear every day. Have a listen to this. Lovely little two-litre flat six. I'll tell you what, he's pushing that thing. He was coming onto the straight there. He wasn't hanging about. He said to me, this car takes about five laps to warm up its tyres. Well, we heard him starting at just getting it warmed up prior to being able to bring out for these demonstration laps, but he was certainly looking forward to it. And if you want to see where Ron's got his set up, opposite to where I was talking about with garages one and two, come all the way up to near race control, what we call the big hamburger in the sky, and you will see Ron has a beautiful display of not only the truck, uh, but he's also got a number of different Porsches, a 356 that he's taken to Monterey, a 356 with a rotary engine. He's got some other cars there and a delightful 1954 Corvette. And, uh, and a 66 Mustang as well, all yeah. painted in that colour known as Goodman Grey. The Goodman Grey. Except yes. for the Corvette. So, that's right. That's, that's, a, that's the original colour in 54, that uh, beautiful, I think it was called uh, like an Indian ivory white. But these cars will head back, and as we uh, certainly see the bow car there, the number 600, getting a little bit sideways, just saying, 
let me warm up the tyres and feel that engine roar. Uh, these supercars, these early supercars from around about 99 through to 2005, will be on display. And there is a series which is uh, running around, just similar to the Group C and Group A, where you can hear these cars at full noise, not just like we have here for demonstration laps. It's great to see them. It's great to see them coming out and being used because if you don't have uh, an historic category for them, then the cars kind of disappear into the ether somehow. You, you wonder where them all ended up. Yeah, and, and that's certainly not what we want. These days, uh, we're just right now talking about going into a, a new series with the Gen 3 supercars. So these effectively are Generation 1. Uh, the Gen 3 supercars with the Camaro and the Mustang about to hit the track next year will be spectacular. But we also appreciate that these early runners are part of this scene and uh, great to see them out. They're, they're looking good and they're being looked after. Well, these are the cars that really... So many people who are motor enthusiasts, sport enthusiasts today, these are the cars that captured their imaginations back in the day and a different sound a, a different set of sponsors a different set of drivers but many of those drivers are still around in motorsport and making a huge contribution so something to celebrate here as part of the super seven is to check out these cars take a look at them congratulate the owners for doing the work that they are and remember what we're talking about here is great teams like larkham motorsport gary rogers motorsport Gibson Motorsport and others that uh, are part of the scene even today. Well, John, that's probably wraps it up. For, we'll have a little bit of a break now. Um, it's lunchtime. It's Go and grab some lunch. Enjoy the afternoon of racing. It's coming at you here at Sydney Motorsport Park, the Super 7 Father's Day weekend. A very happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. And congratulations to all the children who have brought their fathers along and said, we're going to take Dad where he really wants to be. If you want to have a look, refuel at the Garage Cafe. That's uh, got the lunch on there. Also, I mentioned again, the Australian Motoring Heritage Foundation is open from 12.30 through to 2.30. And uh, you just need to go under the tunnel and go and check out where they are. And just next to Garages 1 to 4, there is a marquee that is celebrating the 70 years of the Australian Racing Drivers Club. A uh, mix of cars there from different decades. Go and check that out. Plenty to see here at the Super 7 at Sydney Motorsport. John Goulet, um, obviously a great entry here at Sydney Motorsport Park for round four of the Precision National Sports and Ant Series and a significant part of it will be the Death Wall Trophy. Yes, yeah, correct. You know, it's a very important trophy to all of the, you know, sports and Ant fraternity, particularly the older ones like myself who remember Des clearly and uh, uh, you know, it's it's it's. I've won it a couple of times, or my car's won it a couple of times, and uh, it's something that's you know well thought of, well supported, um, very important to us. It's very popular amongst the observers and the fans of the category as well. Yeah, yes, it, it is. We're always uh, happy to entertain Vicky, uh, Des's wife, and and David will be here. David Wall as well today, we believe. Um, yeah, it's uh, as I said, it's an important event. Yeah. And so far the racing is probably not what you really wanted with the, so much wet weather that they had, but it's certainly entertaining from our perspective anyway. Yeah, yeah, no, well it is, you know, when, uh, it's always difficult racing in the wet, but uh, got to do it occasionally. It's been a number of years since we've had a really wet meeting like this, and uh, uh, yeah, it brings back uh, memories, <laughs> but there you go. Yeah. Well, we wish for you and your category all the best for the rest of this meeting for the rest of the season. Yep, yep, cheers. Thanks for that. All the best. Currently leading the Kumo Tyres New South Wales Sports Sedan Championship, but mixing it with the big boys this weekend, Steve Lacey, how's it going? Yeah, well, it's going pretty well, actually. Um, obviously, the weather's not playing kind to us, but apart from that, yeah, it's a great opportunity having the national guys and the state guys all together. It's a fantastic field, 38 cars, full field for City Motorsport Park. Um, so we're looking forward to a, a good weekend. I imagine the spray were pretty pretty horrendous back in the field. Uh, yeah, the spray was. I mean, I went out there behind Brad and I thought I'll back off a little bit and let him some space, um, which then meant Billy banked up behind me. So then I let Billy through. And then after that, I didn't know who was behind me. It was that bad. So I just sort of played around on my own. 
Well, we wish you all the best for not only in the amongst the national boys, but also in the state championship this weekend. Excellent. Appreciate that. Thanks. Cheers, guys. GT40 cars and said they just look so good together. Yes, they would do. You see uh, real GT40s and, and, and you know, because there's so many replicas on the road, you see cars. This is really great to see some of these cars and all of these uh, Holdens and Fords that you're seeing on the track have all got a history of racing. Yeah, that was um, a lot more fun than I was anticipating. I think I've only sort of driven this in the uh, on slicks in the wet, um, and I was sort of blown away by how much grip the wets had. So no, it was heaps of fun. I was just sort of trying to push my limits without overstepping it. But yeah, heaps of fun and uh, happy to be on pole. With a uh, win this weekend, that'd pretty well uh, wrap the series up for you. Um, with the way the point system is, it sort of only takes one bad race to to lose quite a lot of points. So the main thing is going to be finishing in consistency. So it's sort of not really over till it's over. So we've got to stay consistent, keep finishing. The wet weather that we've had this morning seems to have dissipated the field somewhat. How do you um, treat that? Do you think they'll come back to you a bit more in the race? Um, it's interesting. I think as people sort of get more used to the wet, the field will probably close up a bit, but I've just got to sort of focus on myself and hopefully with the pace that we've got, just not make mistakes and hopefully hold on to the lead. I'm with Ron Goodman, owner of a fantastic collection of Porsches that he races, he restores and absolutely loves. Ron's racing the oldest car in the field here this weekend. And Ron, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about this wonderful old 356 preamble beside us. Uh, it's a 54 Porsche. As you said, it's, it is the oldest one in the field. Uh, it's probably one of the oldest Porsches running around the world. Uh, we've won races all around the world with this car. Um, Laguna Seca being the last one where we took it over and um, we were fortunate enough to even beat Patrick Long, uh, so who is a Porsche factory driver uh, in a speedster. Uh, it's, it's my sentimental favourite, this car. We've built this car from scratch. Um, it's got the best of everything in it as far as the year model is confirmed, like a 54. And it's even got its own movie about which you are part of. Yeah. How long have you been racing this car, Ron? Uh, it'd be around about 20 years now, I reckon 15 to 20 years I've been racing this car and during the time we've had to uh, rebuild it a couple of times, do a few repairs on it but uh, it's, it's my favourite little thing to run around in. There's a few other cars here, some of which I haven't actually seen before, perhaps if we could just walk around we'll just move over to one of the other cars and you can tell us about it. Now Ron, I think it's fair to say that nobody has ever seen a 356 quite like this one. No, the, I got the inspiration for this one from the Janis Joplin car back in the 60s where she done it in all the psychedelic colours. So we contacted Danny Eastwood who's one of Australia's top um, Aboriginal artists. He done all the artwork on it for us and we've decided to drive it to Uluru and on the trip we're raising money for the children's hospital. Oh that's fantastic. Now this isn't all you have here on display this weekend. There's behind us. Now this is something completely different, something it looks to perhaps to some people like just like the the first car we were talking about tell us about the little 356 behind us with the yellow glass yeah, this is a 356 b and i wanted to build something that still retained the porsche dna but literally no one in the world had seen so together with an australian company radial uh, motion down in adelaide we designed and built a three-cylinder radial engine for the back of it which is nitrous oxide injected We've got a full Motec system running the car, handmade steering wheel. Everything on this car is completely handmade. We lowered the car down by an inch and rolled the seals on it to give it a better stance. It looks amazing. I heard it start up earlier, and that is something else again. We'll just walk over to the Formula Ford, which is something a little different from the cars I normally see from Ron. Tell us about this Formula Ford. I've always been so wrapped in the open wheelers, and this one's a Merlin. It's a 1969 British Championship winning car, uh, so it came up on collecting cars and I just had to grab it. You know, and, and then once I got it, we got another body for it and we painted it in our colours. And I've had a lot of fun driving this one around. For those who haven't seen Ron's cars before, you can always pick them. Because with one exception here today, they're always painted what I call Goodman Grey. It's Ron's trademark colour, Goodman Grey with the lime green highlights. Now, immediately behind the, the formula Ford is one of my favorites the Porsche 906 now these things are just absolute automotive art 
I think it's very hard to find a battling car from, from what is certainly for a lot of people the, one of the most iconic periods of historic sports car racing. Mate, this, this thing, I could never drive this car till its full potential. It's, it's so fast and it's so dangerous. Um, I had little Warren Luff drive it at the time attack for us and he even got out, he said it's an amazing car. He'd driven the Warwick Miller, Warwick Miller car before as well. And he said, mate, these cars are just so awesome. They, they, they'll bite you really quick, and when they do bite you, they're going to hurt you. And I'm getting too old to get hurt now, so I just cruise around in it. It's a wonderful looking thing. And uh, behind us, to our, to our right, we've got something again. Not normally what I see with the, in Goodman Grey. It's a Mustang. Yeah, I've always had my 66 Mustangs. I, I've got a weak spot for them. And this one come along, so we just had to grab it and paint it grey. And it's just a, a weekend cruiser that we go out, take to cars and coffees every now and then. And I can go in incognito because nobody expects me to turn up in a Mustang. So the grey could be a bit of a giveaway to some. I think that's what usually gives it away. That's why I go leave the '54 Vet in white. That way, no one will know who I am when well, I come there. Well, that's a, a good segue to the '54 Corvette in white, which is uh, behind us or in front of us now. Uh, and a white car from Ron Goodman? Its original colour was white and that's how I bought it. It's got a lot of original patina to it so I've left it that way. It's a beautiful, beautiful motor car. I can remember, that's a six cylinder car? Correct, yeah, the blue flame engine six cylinder yeah. with the triple carburetors, yeah. The triple carburetors is a bit different, isn't it? No, that's standard. That, that was standard? Yeah, that was standard. Um, it's not the fastest thing you'll ever drive. You just put it in D for dummy and just cruise along the highway, you know. And Ron, you've got another one undercover. You've got any other projects on the on the go at the moment? Yeah, we've got a couple of cars um, that we're sort of working on at the moment that will be coming out soon, and, and they're pretty pretty sweet. Going to be pretty special cars. And, and there's even one more here today, which is which is right above us, and that's a lovely little early 911. It's actually a 912, that one. Is it? Yep, and if you look at the sign writing on that, that's actually pure gold. That's gold leaf, all the sign writing on that one. Well, of course it is. <laughs> on the grey, yeah. yeah. Ron, that's been fantastic to catch up. Um, I think your collection of Porsches is quite outstanding, and it's just wonderful to be able to share it with everybody today. Thanks very much. Thank you, mate. That's very humbling. Thanks, John. As they come down to the checkered flag, it's Mark Lenstra in the Ford Escort that will take the win. He's worked for it and he's well rewarded for it with that win getting across the line just in front. Great of, result for Colton in second. Well, one, one Colton didn't finish and the other's got a second, so it can't be yeah. all bad. And here comes Paul Battersby, a distant third, we might say, but uh, hung in there and the rewards come to him. And this being the trophy race, this is the one you get the little cup for, the and that's important. Ten dollars worth of plastic for which you've worked so hard. <laughs> yeah. It only cost you 30 grand to gather or something. <laughs> uh, now, trophies are important. You look at the major race teams in Australia, they have rooms full of them. So we've got a big gap back to, should be Krista Boys, and he's still just in front of Darren Burns to come down. Well, that Burns has got on the inside of him. Who's going to win the drag to the line? It well, should be the... But it's... I, I think, no, nah, he's just in front. So he's just going to get this, I think. And yeah, I don't no, know. Burns has I got think, him. I think Burns got him. Burns yeah. got him right at the end by one hundredth of a second. And then it's uh, David Wheatley, Wellington, Stevenson, Roberts, the minus window and back glass. John Shuttle, Tweedy still hasn't got to the line. So unfortunately. Uh, uh, one of the few that uh, DNF'd out of this race. So now the following, the next race coming up is the Deswall Trophy event, the final race for round four of the Precision National Sports Sedan Series here at Sydney Motorsport Park. It's also the final race of round four of the Kumo Tyre. New South Wales Sports Sedan Championship. Thanks again, John. We'll be back shortly with live coverage 
on the stream as well as trackside for sports and ants.
Kumo Tyre New South Wales Sports Stands and Precision International Sports New, uh, National Sports Stands rolling out off the dummy group for the final race of the weekend. A big race, a special occasion here at the ARDC Super 70. It's time for the Deswell Trophy race and this one is very, very important to the Sports Stands fraternity. Of course, Deswell, a massive supporter of national and state sports stand racing over many, many years. Uh, former national champion was uh, Des Wall, unfortunately passed away a few years ago. Uh, and there's a perpetual trophy being passed out. It's previously been won by uh, Tony Riccadello. Um, and it, it didn't appear for the last couple of years due to COVID and all sorts of dramas that uh, the whole nation suffered with. And it's good to have it back. I believe his widow Vicky's here and son David are also here to present that later on this afternoon. So we look forward to that. And um, my understanding is they're going to do a, like a parade yep. first time past before the race gets underway on the second pass. This, this race, of course, the National Sports Dance Series, you do a outlap and an extra lap to warm up the tyres, warm up the cars and just be ready and safe for that opening opening lap and journey of track activity. It's the driest the track's been for the well, sports dance this weekend. Is There's dry. no wet. <laughs> That's it Everyone's gone out, I would say, on slicks for this final race, but the problem we had before we jumped on commentary, Gary, was uh, <laughs> we felt a sprinkle. Yeah, and um, if you look out to the right of where we're looking at now, uh, going towards uh, turn six and seven, back, basically in the background of this shot, mm -hmm. there is rain coming. That's it. And as has been all weekend here at Sydney, Right before the rain comes, the wind picks up massively, and right now the wind has picked up yet again. So we'll get through this race, but uh, whether we see some precipitation that is enough to worry drivers on slicks, who knows? But it's sure going to be an adventure for this Des Wall Trophy race, and this is the one that, if you can't win a championship, it's probably the race you want to win alongside things like the 50k plate. It has that sort of prestige in sports and dance racing. It certainly does. And to form up and to make a this uh, parade lap part of the dedication to the memory of Des Wall is something special. And that is why they're doing this slow lap down the straight at the moment. Look at that. Just gives it a moment to be able to take and appreciate sports dance racing in this nation. Phenomenal cars, phenomenal drivers, space frame cars, chassis cars, and this is his slow pass lap in memory of the late Des Wall. It's very emotional, actually. <laughs> it's definitely one to take a photo of and put on the wall, isn't it? It's a huge field, so many different varieties of cars. And that's really been the hallmark of sports dance racing since its inception. You can build something, you can put it together, you you know have to work with the rule book that we've been given, but there's so much variation and so much opportunity for unique creation and ingenuity. Well, they're bespoke cars, aren't they? Mm -hmm. There's no, apart from the Mar cars, which are all fairly similar, I did notice that they were doing engine changes on at least one of those marked cars and the beauty of the way those cars are built the front whole front clips off them the engine comes out you put a new engine put a new clip on and they can do that between races and we've seen that so far uh, i remember a couple of years ago jake camilleri had an incident down at phillip island and they changed the engine between races and i think we've done that here today and we did see one uh, crash earlier and unfortunately got hit by Nick Smith as well so that didn't probably help its cause. That was the uh, Frank Marmorello car. I just noticed as well in the back of shot all of the officials clapping the sports dance coming past as well. We've got to thank every single one of the ARDC Sydney Motorsport Park officials who have been out here all weekend this weekend. It's been incredibly tough weather conditions throughout the weekend. They're a brilliant team to work alongside as we're doing the events. We love being able to chat to them all trackside and thank you to them for all of their effort. We know the Sports Sedan um, family is really thankful for being able to put on this meeting as well, as is every other competitor here. So thank you to the officials. If you'd like to become an official, make sure to check out the ARDC website. There's portals there to be able to get into get into touch with all the people that you need to talk to. Indeed, and uh, they've been tested, the officials, out this weekend. We've had 
Uh, bad weather-wise, rain, but it's been very cold. It and is. A very cold wind blowing. Yep. And when the sun comes out, you feel as though you're going to get burnt. <laughs> That's the sort of conditions we're faced with. So now they are forming up for the start of what will be the third and final race of round four of two championships this weekend. Ten laps to journey. Jordan Caruso, Andre Heimgartner at the front of it. Then it's Steve Tomasi and Brad Shields behind them, followed in turn by Ash Jarvis and Jeff Taunton, Darren Curry, Lachlan Gardner, Billy Chetton and Will Furcher, Steve Lacey, Ben Maddox, Lloyd Godfrey, Nick Mantikas, Theo Camburis, Phil Ryan, etc., etc. We won't get through the field. That's about how big it is as they head down to take the start. Caruso controls when they can go and away they go and it's pretty well line ball between the two cars going through turn one Crusoe on the inside gets the job done Shields into third, Tomasi back to fifth behind Taunton Lacey looks like he's got an exceptionally good start, he's in behind Tomasi, Tomasi break lock up into turn two but gets it under control, Jarvis on the inside of Mason Kelly what a look at that out of turn two so head up around the back of the track for the first time I had to take an intake of breath there for Jarvis <laughs> down the inside he tried to show the nose to Lacey he obviously got a brilliant start but the road runs out down the inside there near the pit wall and now he's dropped back and it looks like he may well lose a position as well uh, as we come through turn five we focus on Lacey and Tomasi up over the hill Lacey is stalking he wants to get through he really wants those championship points. It's, oh, Jarvis with a no, little bit of a uh, wobble in the mid-corner. Yeah, had a hit with Lachlan Gardner. It wasn't mm. Kelly. It was Gardner in the other white Mark One car. And look at Brad Shields putting the pressure on and gets past Caruso. So it's Shields leads the way. Caruso second, Heimgartner third. This is a bit of a turn up for the books. We this, didn't expect this. This is a huge moment in Australian sports sedan racing. That little Fiat built by Joe said they put so much work and effort into it. We've seen it over many seasons in New South Wales racing and now it leads a national championship round outright and the Deswall Trophy race to boot. Well, he's, and now we see uh, Tomasi pull out of the slipstream behind Taunton. Lacey does the same, goes down the inside of the Mark II car, picks up another position. Lacey's doing a good job considering he's up against a national car and looking to go into second spot, quite close behind Tomasi, down at uh, turn two. Gets, not doesn't get the job done, but uh, certainly putting the pressure on. So it's Shirls in front, Caruso second, and then we go back to Heimgartner, Tomasi, Lacey and Taunton, the next three, and they're in quite close company. Wow, what a turn up. We didn't expect Shields to, like from third on the opening, couple of corners back into the lead in um, next to no time. To be leading Caruso and Heimgartner at this circuit in those cars, incredible effort. Oh, Lloyd Godfrey has stopped on the exit of I, turn six. I think the wall stopped him out yeah, there. Yeah, I'm not sure if he's made the wall. It looks like he has, you're correct, but I'm hoping that he hasn't because it's horrible to see one of these cars damaged as Lacey continues to stalk Tomasi. He's got a job ahead of him if he wants to be able to pick up those New South Wales State Championship points because he's got a long way to go to get up the road. Of course, this weekend, proudly brought to you by Kumo Tyre at Sydney Motorsport Park. And Precision International behind the National Sports Stand Series. Make sure to check out their respective websites for all the information. Lacey, very keen to get past Tomasi. I don't think he's got the straight line performance to match the chef powered Calibra down the straight but no. certainly uh, in the cornering department it's, it's, it's the equal if not a little bit better than the Calibra. He's, he's definitely right up there isn't he with him to be able to just be able to put the pressure on all the way around the back of the circuit but as they come down the straight the Calibra just stretches its legs. What will be interesting here is it's the first real dry running we've had at all this weekend so this is the first opportunity for any of them to feel how tyre pressures normalise, what they've got underneath them throughout the race and how they can actually make it all work. As it looks like Lacey's rear is he's got a problem, around, doesn't it? It's bouncing around on that left rear. He, he's got dramas. Um, whether it's broken an upright or done something along those lines, it's certainly uh, very unstable at the rear end mm. going through there. 
Meanwhile, uh, it's uh, Shields in front by just on a second, with Caruso second, and another 1.2 seconds back to Heimgartner in third. This group of cars is uh, allow another five seconds further back. So, big field of cars, lots of different cars. The first chassis car in the field, I think, would be Will Birch's Toyota, Chef Powered Toyota in ninth position at this point. There he is on the screen. He comes through around the hairpin. He's got Crompton behind him, of course. We saw Crompton off in race one. He got bogged down at turn two. Was not able to complete the race. So the whole weekend has been an effort in just getting himself back up the field. And he's up into 11th place now. Yeah, he picked up a lot of positions in race two. They're on a dry setup. They weren't going to change it. I talked to his father, Phil, down there just between races. And he said that uh, they're going to go with it. It was going to rain, he said. We're, going, we're not going to start. So they've gone out in this, and he's now right on the back of Bircher. In what was originally a time attack car, there we've got uh, Scott Cameron and Z Z Kelly, I think. Todd, uh, Mason Kelly, yeah. Todd Kelly's son, and Kelly making the move down at turn two, gets the job done. So we did see him have a moment coming onto the straight in the previous race. It cost him a lot of positions. But he certainly struck back well in this one. He's fighting like hard, isn't he? To be able to pass Cameron down there into turn two. That's a good effort under brakes. Here's Crompton, who is working his way up behind Thurcher. So you've got two very different style of cars here up against each other. Thurcher in the 86, of course, LS1 powered. We've seen it win New South Wales State Championship rounds. And it looks like Crompton's going to look to the inside down in a six and make that move. He does. This is uh, effectively a TA1 car. It was built in Australia, so it's not out of America as we would normally see a TA1 car. But uh, like uh, the likes of uh, uh, Shane Bradford's car. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Mason Kelly with a huge opportunity there around Corporate Hill. Furcher saw him coming and just drifted a little bit wide. Now he's sort of stuck there. But I think Kelly's going to be able to get past Furcher with the pace that he's got. Just it's whether he does it on the straight is probably a different question. Indeed. Then Furcher's car, not in Furcher's hands, won the opening round. Crusoe goes back into the lead. And there's oh, ice. Shields back to the inside. Right. This is on. And Shields will get this spot back. In the meantime, Andre Heimgarten has done the fastest lap of a, of a race. In a track that's probably not conducive to record times, he's just done a 129.7. So it's fairly quick for a cut for that type of car. And look, he's right in this battle as well. So it's now a free car race for the Deswall Trophy, the third and final race here at round four. And there's Heimgarner making a move up the inside. Has Shirl left him room? He has. And he's been managed to hold onto that spot. So. Now it'll be on here at down to the hairpin side seven. by side. They're still side by side. Heimgartner is not giving this one away. Shields isn't giving it away either, but it looks like he's having to make a massive number of corrections in that car. I noticed it out of turn three when Caruso was next to him, and now the hairpin there as well. You can see he was grabbing a whole lot of opposite lock through the corner. Does it again at the final corner here. So I think that car setup just isn't quite there for what he needs from it. And, and Heimgartner, Heimgartner gets past. He's done the job there. So last lap for Shields was a 30.4. We had a 30.07 from Caruso, and look, he's got the he gets the job done down the straight. So, cars mega when they what boost comes move. on, and obviously has the brakes to go with it. Although Heimgartner will come back at him here at turn two, not quite close enough, and it, certainly the drive will be with the Aston out of this corner. You would think on that last lap, a 30.8 for the race leader, 31.7 from Heimgartner. 33-0 from Shields, so we know Shields' car's quicker than what it did on that last lap, but he was in the process of being passed. In the meantime, Jordan Caruso takes full advantage and says, well, I'm not hanging around waiting for you guys, I'm out of here. <laughs> that was Caruso's moment to get his head down and run away, because he knew that those two would battle behind him, and he has, so he's opened up 1.7 seconds last time across the line. Heimgartner managed to dispatch with um, Shields between three and four across the hill and we'll have to see what he can do now to close up that gap as Crompton starts to close in on Kelly. He's got up to 10th place. Kelly is in ninth. So that is a move forward for him and it looks like Furcher is falling into the clutches 
of Cameron behind as well in the back half of the top 15 here at so Sydney Motorsport Park. Just looking down the order, after Shirls, it's Tomasi, Lacey, Taunton, Gardner. Jarvis is in position 8, Kelly 9, Birch at 10. Then it's Cameron Chetton in 12th, Shane Woodman in 13th. We've seen him go off in the earlier race. Liam Hooper, now that it's dry, is starting to make some inroads as well, followed by Michael Robinson, Anthony Cox, Nick Mantikos. Uh, Wright and Mannix the next two. Mark Duggan has just returned to the lane in the Commodore as well, so unfortunately for him, no further part in this race. Yeah, Fred Assisa and Darren Curry are two others that have decided to pull out of this one, or for whatever reason, so they're back, back in the pits. We're just completed, we're on lap seven of this, or just completed lap six, on lap seven of a ten lapper, Ken Heimgartner catch the race leader. It's 3.1 seconds the difference between the pair. And at this stage, Heimgartner is about, he did a 27.3 to the first sector, 26.8 from our race leader. So effectively the race leaders just pulled a little bit of a margin and it might be just enough to see him through. What sort of speed are they doing down the straight? 261 kilometers an hour the last time through for Andre Heimgartner, the quickest of the cars in the front running order. The man moving in this little battle that we've got on screen is just behind them. It's Shane Woodman in that BMW. There it is, the Riverside Racing prepared car. He dispatched with Chetton on the last lap, opened up a couple of seconds gap on him immediately and is now charging towards these two in front. So Woodman's obviously feeling comfortable and confident inside that BMW and he'll be able to draw himself up there. Oh, Heimgartner is off the road. Where's that? That's the final corner. He's, He's facing spin. backwards at the final corner. So something has gone majorly wrong there. I think he's just had a lose by the look of it. Gets well, it back on track. We'll see if he goes to the pit lane here, but that is an uncharacteristic moment there for that driver and that car. Well, you wouldn't know. There's lap traffic is something they've had to deal with. We've seen Jordan Caruso in race one have uh, difficulties with lap traffic, and maybe that's the reason... We, we, we unfortunately we missed what the actual what happened there but we hopefully will uh, we might get some word on what the drama was we're looking back at some of the division three new south wales competitors at the moment that's dave aiken in the ls powered bmw uh chassis car and he's the kumo tire supplier here's woodman making a move on scott cameron down at turn two so woodman now moves himself up one more spot and that would put him up into position um, 13. So even if you're making up spots, you've still got a long way to go. Will Such Birch. a big field to work oh, through. That's and the problem. what a good field. It's probably yeah. the strongest field of sports sedans we've seen, certainly in New South Wales, for quite a long while. When you think that some of these cars here are, are top five cars and they're running outside the top ten, it's just amazing how quick they are. And he's... Fircher now under pressure from Woodman as they go through turn six. Because Fircher's car, formerly a Time Attack Toyota 86, has a LS Power unit shoehorn under the bonnet and it seems to be quite an effective weapon as far as he's concerned. It won the opening round of the New South Wales Championship with the guy who's piling the car behind him at the wheel because Will Fircher had a shoulder issue, couldn't drive it. Cameron, who was doing the National Series, wasn't racing that weekend, was here. He was given the job in the car and did the magic job of winning a race. And the chance here he might try and displace the car that he won that opening round in. How good is it to see all through the field, sports stands in close quarter combat? Just time after time, corner after corner, making moves and passing each other. As now, it looks like Cameron's going to look to the inside of Furcher into one. They're going to run side by side through there giving each other just enough room. Great respect for racing. Now Fircher will try to outbreak him down into two, and he does. Well, Fircher wasn't going to let him go past, <laughs> was he? But he's run wide at... Oh, uh, almost ran wide. He managed to recover it, and now will continue on in that spot. And to think that this is a battle for 12th position. <laughs> they won't give an inch, though, and the growth of them will get out of the car with big smiles on their face with two laps to go. Caruso has got a 9.3 second lead. You can see from the graphic on the side of the screen over um, over Brad Shields at the moment. So Brad Shields with that early run. Now Cameron, speaking of runs, to the inside. 
of Fircher. He's going to try the move at six, locks the rear brakes up, but backs it in and manages to get to the apex. Fircher was, I think, quite forgiving of him there. And yeah, gave him I think Fircher seen him coming and thought, yeah. no, I'm not going to turn in here or else I'm going to cop a Commodore into the side of my car. Exactly. There's Steve Lacey in the background. Was that Billy Chetton in the background trying to make up a bit of ground? Lacey's ahead of this group, of course, at the moment in fifth position and doing a job. So 13.1 seconds a gap between first and second. And Five Gartners just passed Lacey for position down the middle. They're on the last lap. Last lap now, and Caruso leading the way by 13.1 seconds. So he'll be well and truly around the back section of the circuit while these guys make their way down the front straight. Cameron holding off Fircher here. And it's going to be a comfortable gap for him. You can see Chet just slowly closing on them. Probably hasn't had the pace we expected from him this weekend. But here's our man. He got the race lead off Brad Shields in that incredible battle in the early stages. Ever since then, he's been able to open the gap, open the gap up. And now with 13 seconds in hand, he's going to bring it home to take home the Deswall Trophy. Not the first time that this car's won that race, but the first time for Jordan Caruso. And he will win the fourth round of the Position National uh, Sports Sedan Championship. So he comes down, takes the checkered flag well and truly in advance of his rivals. And that pretty well puts a, uh, a signing off on the championship. I don't know if anyone competing from that point. Brad Shirls on in Joe Set's Fiat 124 Coupe, powered by a twin rotor turbo power plant. Comes home in second spot. Third spot will go to Steve Tomasi. Second in the championship will retain that spot in the championship. Jeff Thornton in the Mark car. Then it's Andre Heimgartner. We'll try and pass him down the straight. Is he quite close enough to get it done? No. Uh, not quite, I think. Doesn't like it. Let's go back to this division battle. Curry continuing to chase down Atkin in that prime tyre as BMW. And you can see Crompton looking to the inside. Curry's going to look to the inside as well to try to send it, as the number plate says, on that Civic to the inside. But he's not going to quite get there as they come to the line. Great race-long battle between those pair. Cameron will lead home Furcher as well in the inter-class uh, battle, I guess you could say, the national versus the state competitor. That's the local battle. The locals, though, yes. They've raced each other a lot, and Cameron brings it home for 11th place. Crompton got up to 10th. Here comes Michael Robinson across the top of the hill. He's probably one that we might have expected to see in the thick of things yeah, a bit I think more the, across the, the weekend. Yeah, I think the of the first couple of races probably didn't suit him, but certainly got a bit better there. Nick, Nick Mantikos in the sports sedan spec mark two car comes across the line ahead of liam hooper in uh, what effectively would be 17th position then it's right uh grant donaldson in the mark car followed by phil ryan the tire power blaney datson with the ls power unit would be home in position 20 we go back to fair converus darren steedman in the escort chev then it's mannix Moynihan, Giesler, um, followed by Aiken, then it's Khoury, and bringing up the rear would be that Tirana of uh, McSwain. A few non-finishes or that didn't get to the line that we may have missed, uh, Tony, uh, Anthony Cox, John Spatiri, Mark Duggan, of course, we've seen going to the pits. Fred Assisa didn't finish. Darren Curry went to the pits. Lloyd Godfrey, we've seen um, up against the concrete wall out of turn six. And uh, non-starters in that one, Nick Smith, Frank Marmorello and Shane Bradford. That's so, it for Sports Sedans. We're going to take a quick break from there. We're back with more racing shortly. Group S cars for production sports will be out shortly.
Group S production sports cars out on track for their third and final race, a fourth and final race for the weekend. And uh, it's been entertaining behind Wayne Seabrook, who seems to be in a class of his own. Of his own. Got John Young with me to uh, call the action here in what is a trophy race. So this is the most important race of the weekend, really. Well, this trophy is, of course, highly sought after. <laughs> and, and people will be, you know, having just thrown over 5,000 at the car just to make it faster for the trophy. Uh, yeah, facetiously, you mentioned that earlier. But... Uh, Again, we will see uh, Wayne Seabrook off the front pole position with Doug Barber alongside him. So we've got Porsches sharing the front row, Damien Meyer on the inside of the second row and um, Mickey Paylard out of well, position four. So he's in a prime position there. We might see a repeat of yeah, yesterday's day. Yes, that's right. Uh, Jeff wasn't 100%, Morgan wasn't 100% today apparently, so uh, didn't come out and play. Um, You've got uh, Seabrook. We've got uh, a couple of people dropped out after the last race. We saw James, James Calvin Jones uh, uh, slowing a bit in that race, and I don't know what the problem was, but it was enough uh, to cause him to put it on the trailer. We've got uh, a wind, hand out the window there for the Alpha. It uh, looks that way, doesn't it? Yeah, he's uh, indicating that he may have a drama. Well, that's uh, not in the program, but it's uh, Harris in the uh, in the 309 car, I believe. Yeah, certainly. Um, no, I think well, you'll probably just go straight to the pits, I would imagine. I would think so. Uh, another dropout was another Alfetta, the very pretty excellent in the cloud car being driven by uh, Bill McGoffin. Came in after the last race with uh, uh, a... a bit of a problem in terms of lack of oil pressure and yeah. uh, they've decided to put that away. Kent Brown moves into his spot uh, normally fill up grids on the Group S. Oh that's interesting because most categories that they um, they take the position that they finish the last race and, in. And this is a bit of a shambles uh, um, anyway uh, It is what it is and we've certainly got less numbers than we've had earlier in the week and, and Wayne Seabrook has the car pointing right quite aggressively so and Doug Parber has his pointing left the revs rise and they're away Seabrook gets a really good start but there's nothing in it Doug Barber in the dark blue Porsche 911 number 911 right beside him but then as they took second third gear it was Seabrook who took away and then it was uh, a little bit further back uh, Perlay challenging Barber as they come up towards turn two Damien Meyer and the midget battling with his lack of horsepower as Terry Lawler comes screaming around the outside in the big Shelby 350 GT. Pops behind him and then it's uh, Tom Wallstab in the Porsche 928 uh, behind the Datsun as they head back over uh, towards turn three with, three with Seabrook in the lead and so far no changes except Damien Meyer has lost that spot to Terry Lawler. The cubic inches in the uh, 350 GT uh, taking their toll on uh, on the on the MG midget. Yeah, and if you're watching uh, live timing at all, uh, Perlay it just doesn't come up on the first sector timing. Uh, it doesn't trigger it for some reason. It happened yesterday. It's happened again today. But he does fall back in once we get through the second sector. So at the moment it's Seabrook, Barber, Perlay, then it's uh, Terry Lawler, Meyer, Potts, Wallstad, Western, Holtz. Wilson Brown, as you said, Calvert Jones hasn't taken the start. He's not there at all. Tom Wallstab having a really good weekend, I think, in the in the nine to eight. Yeah, um, that car's locked over up the grid and what we would normally see it. Well, he's been driving it for a while now, so you know familiarity uh, does go a long way. And there's nothing like track time. Indeed. Now the where the Shelby is really strong, the GT350 is down the straight. It's got about 20 kilometres an hour on the Porsches. And here it comes. And now, there goes one. Interestingly, uh, we said in the morning race that Seabrook didn't open up a lead like he did yesterday, and there goes Potts past uh, Meyer, but I think not for long. I think Meyer's going to hang on to that around the outside. Down towards the back of the field, we've got uh, a good battle going on with... Uh, Bajan staying ahead of Daly in the golf coloured uh, Datsun 2000. You were making a comment about Seabrook, not going too far ahead. 2.575. Oh, Wals- 
Wallstab's uh, overdone it there at turn two. And he loses yet another position, this time to uh, Selwood's Alpha. But I don't think that'll stay for long. You, you know you've just put the commentator's curse on him by yeah. saying how well he'd been running. I know, it's my fault. I'm sorry, Tom. <laughs> now, we, I thought now, you a... might be alluding to the fact that Seabrook was quite... It wasn't that far in front of the previous race that yeah. he may have had a drama or some sort. Now, just great little battle here, and it's two ex-presidents of the Group S Racing Association. Car 75, Brian Weston, is that great little sprite. Colin Wilson-Brown and Car 11, the 105 Series Alpha. And he's been racing for, I would have thought, 25 years at least. Uh, so he certainly knows the car. So what's going to happen? I reckon that uh, Lawler is going to have a good go at getting uh, second position down the straight this time. Well, if he can get close to Barber out of turns 10 and 11, he surely will have the pace, and he looks like he's close enough to do something about it. I think so too. As they come out in the straight, Meyer in position five there. There's not much he can do about that at the moment. Here comes Lawler out of the slipstream and just sails on past the 9-11, 9-11. Yeah. And into second position. So it's five seconds from Seabrook back to uh, Lawler. But the question is what Lawler will be able to do in a time sense uh, now that they're... Uh, well, uh, the last the lap, uh, Seabrook did a 46.69 and Lawler did a 48.52. So he's about two seconds, uh, just under two seconds off the pace of our race leader. And knowing the way that uh, Wayne Seabrook... Uh, does his races it's not going to be a chance that anyone's going to get close to him. Although they did get a little bit close to him in the last yeah, race. Yeah, the last race was a bit of a surprise. Mm. So we've got uh, Burson there in car 90, the Datsun 240Z. Now, he was well back in the field yesterday. It's a new car for him. He's been used to driving uh, uh, a two-litre Porsche and he's um, moved into this Datsun 240Z and when you look at it in the garages down there, it's a really sharp-looking thing. It's been nicely prepared, nicely presented. And uh, he's uh, beginning to move a long way up further in the field this race, and he's been uh, formally in the weekend. And Wallstad has got that spot back ahead of Selwood. Unfortunately, however, he's, uh, the Weston and uh, Wilson Brown were behind him and are now in front of him. And I don't know if he'll get them back. It's a big car, that 9 to 8, isn't it? Mm. Certainly a nice car. I've got a friend of mine who's got a 9 to 8. It is oh, they're a river quite car. Light. River car. Mm. Not many of them raced. No. Um, but I can remember um, Ian Hamilton, who's the founder of Auto House Hamilton, the Porsche specialist in Sydney, Ian Hamilton saying uh, to me many years ago that he was going Group S, a 9 to 8 would be the car that he would have chosen. Oh, there you go. So here comes Burson. He's uh, really got the bit between his teeth this afternoon. He's come up now to uh, take uh, uh, Selwood's Alpha. So uh, that would put him into 11th position. And I reckon he's going to uh, frighten, um, frighten Tom Wallstab before this is over. Unless Wallstead's doing about the same place. Just checking their respective times on that lap. Wallstead did a 54. They both did 54, actually, but Wallstead was about four tenths faster. So not much in it. So we have uh, Colin Wilson-Brown now challenging car 21. That's Warren Hotz in uh, another of the MG Midgets. He seems to have shaken clear now of Brian Weston in the, in the British Racing Green Sprite. So Wilson Brown now ranges up alongside Warren Hotz and uh, ooh, almost claims his position, but uh, Mr Hotz decided to close the door, as was his as was his right to do. Yeah, well, he took the line. Now, mind you, the, the angle that we get makes it look a little bit closer than probably what it is. Still, you'd want to make sure your brakes worked, wouldn't you? Indeed. Well, the Alpha's pretty good in that department. So Wayne Seabrook just comes in to complete lap four. 7.2 seconds ahead of Lawler. Actually, it's more like about 9.3 seconds now. 
So he is going quicker. He did a 46.1 on that lap, and Terry did a 48.26. So he's about two seconds a lap faster each lap round than the second place uh, GG350. And they're going to have the change of positions between the midget and the alpha again down the straight. Yep. And right. Walls, it just Walls, goes. Wall stab uh, takes the uh, takes the Brian Weston uh, sprite. So uh, a little bit of shuffling going through that mid pack. There's all good close racing there. And uh, Colin Wilson Brown will now try and get away from uh, Hots because he doesn't want to be having to battle with the grunt of the nine to eight down the straight later no. in the race. Well, certainly it would have the top end, I would imagine, speed-wise. So, as I say, we're coming up to the halfway mark of this race. Seabrook leading, Lawson in, uh, Lawler in second, Dennis Barber, Meyer, Wayne Potts in that 280Z, then followed by Wilson Brown and Holtz, Wallstead, Weston in ninth, and uh, Silwood. In 10th position, just outside of that 10, we've got uh, Brown Bajan. Bajan, of course, was unfortunately a uh, a wall victim, you might say, out of... He was, he was. It was... Um, race one. Most unfortunate, but great that they're able to... Uh, it was superficial uh, rather than uh, something more deep-seated <laughs> and heartbreaking. So they were able to patch the car up. There's obviously, it's been beaten out with a, with a sledgehammer. There's the paint's missing as well as anything else. What's, um, it, what's it like getting pieces for uh, for an MG? Guards, etc. Um, it's okay. Uh, but they're, I mean, you, they're not everywhere. They'll panel beat. They'll yeah. panel beat They'll that. panel beat out. There's a yeah. fair bit of metal in it. Yeah. Uh, so I think they can probably, they'll probably just beat that out. Uh, where you get into a bit of trouble sometimes is some of the MGBs with aluminium bonnets. Um, so here comes Tom Wallstab up on uh, Warren Hots in the, in the midget. He's getting closer and closer as they come up to turn one. He pulls into the inside, but no, nothing doing now. So he singled his intention that he will go past these. Unfortunately, he had that little bit of an off earlier. Well, the problem for Tom now is that uh, is that Warren Hotz has the uh, has the midget uh, handling uh, over the back of the circuit. So. Uh, uh, it's now we're in the in the part of the circuit that really favours the little MG and, uh, and Sprite. So there's a green flag being waved, yeah, so which it means presupposes the, there was a yellow one somewhere so else. Maybe turn one, there might have been a yellow flag. So yeah. if we've got a green one there, and there it is. It's Brian Weston. So unfortunately, that's come to a halt between turns one and two, I would assume. Yep. Might Brian. be a bit wet underfoot there, I would imagine. Yes, that's right. It, uh, it's bad luck for Brian. It's... Uh, so the car won't be driven onto the trailer by the looks of things. It would be a flat Rob, tow, though. Yeah, Rob Burson um, still keeping Selwood at bay, but not seemingly... Well, he would now be up into 10th because Weston, who was 10th, is now out of the race. So Wallstab 9th, Hots 8th. This is Rob Burson in uh, car 90 in a beautifully prepared red uh, Datsun. Followed by Tom Wallstab in the uh, in the nine to eight. Sorry, followed by Doug Selwood in the white uh, Alpha. I saw a flash of white and got that wrong. <laughs> Easy mistake to make. I make heaps of them. At the moment, though, Seabrook's out in front by 14.2 seconds over Lawler. Barber in third. He's a further almost five seconds adrift uh, ahead of Pilard, Dennis Meyer, Potts, Wilson Brown. Holtz, Wallstead in ninth, Selwood in 10th. Still waiting to go past the start finish line. They have. So they're on lap seven in this race. Yes. So, so four, four races seems to be uh, the undoing of. The fourth race seems to be a problem for a lot of people. For historic yes, uh, they're, weather. They're and, and there's. Brian, Brian Weston, ruining the fact that they decided to have a fourth, right. fourth race today. Doing all right up until then. It uh, looks like Tammy Lee Hots in the uh, in the midget getting by Daly's uh, Datsun 2000. And uh, behind them, uh, Sam Gurgis in the uh, yellow MGB. Uh, that car, I think I saw on 
uh, by105.com as being uh, an available race car for somebody look, look, getting, looking to get into this class. And Sam goes down the inside of the Datsun. I'm wondering if the Datsun's having a few problems because he seems to have dropped back a bit. Yeah, this was the Japanese answer to uh, MGs, wasn't it? It was indeed. And it was a pretty good answer, too. And of course, Japanese cars back in the 60s and were built off blueprints from British cars, were they not? Well, Japanese cars in the 60s, if you, if you drove one, you were, you were being almost radical. <laughs> I, I, my first car was a 1968 Corolla. And I reckon that Daly has got a problem in that uh, Datsun because Sam Gurgis passed him very easily over the back there. There's Damien Meyer now looking to get past Mickey Perlade. Yes, now the tyres have got a bit hot at Perlade's Porsche. Um, Meyer will be looking to get up to, uh, to fourth position in this race. Yeah, he's carrying more speed, isn't he, at the moment? Oh, he carries a lot of speed around the back. A lot of speed. It's hard to get an accurate time on Perlade because his transponders having problems and there it is job done turn five well he went to take a classic line and allowed uh, it, the power of the Porsche is something to behold when he decides to, <laughs> <laughs> to put it down and, yeah. and this is when Damien Meyer was going How, why can't I have a two litre engine yeah. Which you did. yeah if you can have a two litre engine you probably give him a run for their money and of course he's got the front straight to deal with where he's Maximum speed is about 175 clicks, and the Porsche is doing about 205 clicks. But certainly around the rest of the track, the midget is right on the money, particularly in the hands of Meyer. And as we've already mentioned, his brother Simon Meyer was unfortunately caught out in the wet of qualifying and gave the uh, silver midget a little bit of a... A little bit of a tap. A uh, massage at the back, and I think it's broken something in the rear end for sure, and yeah. he, ha he hasn't been able to race, which is indeed unfortunate because those two midgets in the wet would have given the Porsche some real hurry up. Well, negative camber on the rear of a midget has never been a good look. <laughs> no, it wasn't as the manufacturer intended. No, and here's Tony O'Toon in the Shelby. Uh, now, are they uh, lapping the Shelby? I think they are. Yes, they have. Yep. Um, So they've gone through to complete eight laps, so we've got less than two laps to go in this the trophy race. And it'll be certainly one of many that uh, Wayne Seabrook has collected. He would have numerous from his uh, national tour of Group S races around Australia over the last oh, few yeah. years. He's the, the, the everywhere there's been one on, he's been racing in it, whether it be Winton or Morgan Park or wherever they happen to be, both for Sydney tracks or now the one Sydney track and also raced down at more, um, Wakefield Park in the past. I was and just trying to look up the, the lap records. Mm. I've been totally unsuccessful in my quest. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I don't think uh, Wayne Seabrook is close to lap record today. One minute 45.76. Yes, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure Seabrook's in the 45s. Well, Wayne had held it. Yeah. Well, it took him a while because Jeff had a pretty quick lap here for a long while. That, uh, that uh, Morgan and Seabrook, between the two of them, have uh, held most of the Group S uh, outright lap records. Well, Seabrook's just gone through to start the last lap as we continue to watch this battle for what is fourth position. Mickey Perlade and Damien Meyer, two very different sorts of motor vehicles. To produce about the same lap time, but unfortunately for Damien, the Porsche is always in the front when it matters. Yes, yes, which is about now. Now, uh, <laughs> and uh, Doug Barber having a, a nice, uh, comfortable uh, race there, um, not in close company of anybody. Uh, Terry Lawl has walked away from him, and he's uh, five seconds up the road from the Perlade and Meyer battle, and. Uh, it's the field's begun to spread out quite a bit now. Uh, you've got Wilson Brown, the closest is between Wilson Brown and Warren Hotz at the moment. Uh, they're within a second of each other. Um, but really, uh, the Porsche has just that much more power down the straight for Mickey Perlade. Uh, I don't think there's a chance that, uh, that uh, Damien Meyer's going to uh, make this one a... a, a, a 
another podium finish, which is bad luck, but certainly a class win. There's Wayne Seabrook now. I think this is coming up to the uh, to the checkered flag, is it not? Yeah, this Seabrook. will be the checkered flag. Wayne Seabrook out in front. Four race starts this weekend and four comfortable victories, you might say. And fastest lap to boot. So, you know, that's what you'd call a good weekend for Wayne Seabrook, isn't it? Just gave the wipers a bit of a rub there. I don't know what the idea of that was. Uh, might have been a few spots of moisture on the front of it. So I don't I think we're out of the the uh, wet weather danger yet. No, there was a, a cloud last time I looked. Uh, last, not that we could see the magic. dark one. Yeah. Now they come onto the straight and there's battle for the fourth and fifth. But it's going to be Mickey Perlade who uh, just pulls away from Damien Maher as they head down towards the, the start-finish line as Doug Barber finishes in third. Then it's Mickey Perlade, followed by Damien Meyer and in the background, Wayne Potts in the Datsun 280Z. So that's all done and dusted. Not quite back here. This is back further in the field. This has been a really good battle race long between uh, Rob Burson and Doug Selwood. Um, I think that Burson's going going to get this. So if you, once you see the side shot, um, the Datsun's a fair way ahead of the, of the Alfetta. And it'd have a bit more straight line squirt too, wouldn't it? Well, Doug giving it all the, the, the track in the world to try and get a fast run onto the straight. But I don't think it's going to be enough. Well, there we get to see a prime example that eh, he's not losing any ground to him, so no, still no. won't matter. And they're going to finish ninth and 10th outright. Yeah, OK, well, we're going to take a quick break and we're going to be back with Supercarts for their trophy race very shortly. We're here with Nick Shembury, the Australian 125 Gearbox champion running at Sydney Motorsport Park this weekend. So far, three from three. Yeah, no, it's been a very good weekend so far. So, yeah, we, we've come here on a bit of a high after winning the Australian Championship uh, in Phillip Island a couple of weeks ago. So, yeah, it's been good. A bit wet, but uh, enjoying it. Awesome track. Have you been here before? Yeah, we came here once or twice before, um, back in 2019, I think it was. Um, we raced around the Australian Championship here, but haven't been since. So when the event came up, I thought, we got to make the trip because you know, it's an awesome facility, awesome track. So, yeah, I was keen to come race. Now, you won the first race pretty easy yesterday. The second race was a little bit of a different proposition. Was that down to tyres? Yeah, the second race was a bit of a, a bit of a dilemma with tyres. It was a bit of a catch-22. Some of the track was starting to dry up a little bit. Some of the track was wet. Um, so pressure-wise, we probably went a bit low, struggled to get the tyres to work, um, found it quite slippery. So, yeah, luck fell in our, in our favour a little bit to, to win that race. But, yeah, now we're back on the money this morning, so hopefully we can finish off race four the same way. Well, wish you all the best of luck for your race this weekend and um, go for the clean sweep. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, that's the plan.
Okay, we're back with the trophy race for Supercarts for the weekend. John Pellegrano joins me in commentary for this one. And uh, there's a bit that came out of that earlier race. We talked about uh, the different tyres that they may have been using, wets, dries, new wets, old wets, etc., etc. You probably allude a little bit more to exactly um, who was on what. Well, uh, Gary, uh, uh, between uh, the last race and this particular outlet, yeah, I, a bit like yourself, I did a bit of... I was a bit confused as to what was happening. And, uh, yes, um, the front-running car, uh, Nick Shimbury, was on um, used uh, Dunlop wets, which uh, have got outstanding uh, wear componentry to them, even in the dry. Um, Lee Vella put on a new set of uh, very soft, wet tyres, and I think they lived for about two laps, and he was finished. Um <laughs> The others went out on on wets that almost turned into slicks and uh, some of the guys had slicks and they had a bit of difficulty at the beginning because uh, there was a few wet patches. Um, yeah, look, let's, uh, they, they, I think the weather threw a spanner in the works. The 125, or well, certainly the front runners, should have been a tad closer and hopefully front runners or potential front runners like Mark Robin won't sort of get knocked out and... And, um, yeah, it should be interesting. Uh, so all that wet weather tyre talk won't matter now because there'll well, be a lot no, of sleeps. Well, no, it won't matter now. And look, <laughs> it's, it's actually very, very good that um, they're going to get a dry race. They haven't had a dry race. And um, we'll see, hopefully, a more... Uh, well, I'm hoping to see a slightly different outcome. A balance, uh, a more of a balanced race. Yeah, uh, the, a predictable race. Yeah, the front running 125s, so three or four of them, should really be a little bit closer. Um, it'll be interesting. Um, be interesting to see what unfolds. But uh, as you can see, they're, they're 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 gridded up in their finishing order. I, as I said, I had a I had a chat to Paul Campbell and uh, had a chat. Uh, Aaron Coggers in the race now. He had electrical problem. He was out. He's one of the front runners. Yeah, most certainly. I've uh, seen him. Race Mark it. Robin's a little bit further back than he'd like to be due to a little mishap. In uh, the earlier race, earlier race, and then so, we've got the uh, stock Hondas at the back of this. We've got the group. stock. Yes, we have, and uh, they're a little bit tidier now. So we've got Dylan Stevenson out the front in the 250 National, and uh, hope I suspect the front runner won't, front running 125s won't take long to catch him, and hopefully he'll stay in the mix with them now that it's dry. He's certainly got the uh, power to stay there, so. Let's, uh, now now you can see the group's a little bit tighter. And Lee Vella trying Lee to go around yes. the outside, but yes. can't quite do it. Well, no. they're all on slicks now. They're probably new. They're all on new slicks now. So you can see now the arrangements. And away you go. You've got... Um, and, and Shembury all of a sudden back to four for well, the one, two, five. Well, as a, uh, well, I was hoping this was sort of the, the kind of scenario we could expect in the last race. They're a bit closer. And, look, once these guys get together and they, 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 they love having a bit of a, you know, well, you just saw that Nick, uh, Lee Vella just touched Nick. But they'll get in there and have a red-hot go and and, and um, hopefully oh. they'll... they'll I don't think you'll see any real breakaways. Uh, they're catching Dylan Stevens now in his 250, and he'll be in and amongst it. And um, yeah, it'll be interesting. Well, we've just got to sit back and see what happens. And uh, they're pretty cagey fellas, these guys. I mean, Nick's probably the youngest in the group. And he's and, just gone to the lead. Yeah, and he'll now, he's now going to be hard, hard to catch. Yeah. He's just, when he gets a bit of fresh air in him, he's... Uh, He's gone. He's Laurie gone. Fuchs had second for a little while, but I oh. think uh, Lee Vella's now got past him. So we've got one, two, fives in at least the first three positions, four positions, because Paul Campbell's moved up a spot as well. They'll slowly, they'll slowly start to tackle Dylan in the 250. Um, but now Dylan should technically have a little bit. He'll he'll stay in front of him here. He's he's got the legs. And as you can see, starting to creep up on Laurie Fuchs. He just had his hand up then. I just wonder what that would be about. But, oh, who knows? Maybe an acknowledgement more than anything. Let's hope so. But was, and I, when we spoke to Neil Shemby earlier, we were actually talking, uh, not on camera, but talking about uh, he doesn't have a rear wing 
on his cart. He just runs the rear fins. No, his, his is a late model Anderson, and typically the Andersons, uh, for whatever reason, in Europe, in, or certainly in England, they run them without the rear wing. Um, we, we have maintained the rear wings, but look, there's a, a multitude of theories regarding the rear wing. Um, I'd argue if, if some of the theories held water, it would mean that some of these carts with wings on them shouldn't be where they are. But um, look, it, typical motor racing stuff, everyone's got a theory. Well, as you say, if, if someone starts winning with a wing, then they'll all put them on. If they win without a wing, they'll all take them off. Well, I, 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 can, I can disclose that um, all the non-Anderson carts have got very 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 low drag wings so i would i would say that there's they're very good they're, they're not they're not a hindrance um but if if the carts start winning with wings on them you'll find in time they'll all have wings yeah uh, so one of the stock hondas out of commission the 143, yes, that's, uh, Shane Thompson, is it? Yes, that's uh, yeah. Stock Honda. Uh, and now we've got... Um, now, where's our South Australian f- friend? Oh, no, he's a little bit... Well, if you note, in the in the previous race, you had the South young South Australian fellow, a young uh, Twiggin and Mark and Mark Vickers were a yeah. lot closer, but this time they're a little bit... Twiggin's in... Tenth, per- oh, tenth he's... Spot. he's, he's He's checked out. He said goodbye. I'm gone. So it's only half a second between Chambry and Bella. And to be honest, this is where I thought it'd be from the very start that these two would be the ones that might fight out the races here. And yes, um, you're, you're correct. And uh, Fook is now uh, four seconds further back, just ahead of Robin, and um, or Robin, I should say. Then yeah. it's uh, Aaron Cogger in fifth position. Adam Stewart in sixth. Paul Campbell in seventh, um, and then it's uh, Robert Trimmer. The next one through in eighth. And actually, I think there's uh, um, Car- a Mark Vickers. No, my mistake. 80 is Adam well, Stewart. So he's dropped spots while we've been talking about yeah. it. That's why I've called him in the wrong spot there for a little well, while. Well, if, if, if Nick's gap's only about... Oh, well, oh, sorry. Vela's gap's only about half a second. That's probably, uh, in the scheme of things, it's probably presentable, given that Nick did a good job on him um, um, in the previous race. Um, unfortunately, Mark, Mark Robin started a little bit further back and... And this is the problem you've got when they start to lose a bit of ground. Um, yeah, it's very, very difficult to make up with, with machines that are quite evenly, well, they're reasonably matched. Um, and as soon as they get away, it's a little bit hard for them to pick up. Do you, is there any benefit in two, two guys working together for the slipstream? Does that work with these carts? Ah, oh, they... They, they don't think like that. They, they just <laughs> no. It, it, look, it's that's it, look. All that's very good in theory, but um, I, I can assure you, I know them quite well. And the minute they put a helmet on, it's yeah, race faces. Uh, on. Yeah, they couldn't care yeah. less. It's yeah. just uh, they're um, you know uh, they're, they're they're out to, they're out for themselves. You know this they don't. A... Um, and I mean, you've only got to look at Laurie and uh, Mark Robin. I mean. Uh, you know, they're not working together. They're uh, they're fighting. Yeah, and Robin's just got past and, Fuchs. And you know, technically speaking, they're kind of slowing themselves down. But no, no, they don't work together at all. They're um, and anyway, the, the the gap now between Robin and 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 Vela's just it's a little bit too far now. Yeah, it's, it's blowing just, out a bit. Hasn't well, it? it's it's about six and a half seconds. Yeah. So. It would be very, very difficult for Mark to make up. He may make a little bit of ground, but you've only got to look at the gap. There we go. We've got the big screen shot down Um, the straight of just how far Bella is in front of his rivals. Yeah, even even Nick's sort of, you know, edging away. So Here's Cogger making a move on Campbell, or the pair going side by side, actually, through turn one. Yeah, they, they, those two are a, a, a long-time sparring partners. I, in fact, I, I will say it's good to see Campbell in front for a change, but 
that that that's likely to change. Those two will ding dong all the way to the checkered flag. But um, yeah, the, t- the the three groups are, are somewhat materialised now, and they'll stay. You'll get Laurie and Mark, you know, sort of tangling together and. A little bit behind them, you'll get uh, Paul Campbell and uh, Aaron Cogger. And the other two up the front will just sort of cruise away. Yeah, and we mustn't forget the other classes that are running here, the no, we've Rotex. Got the Rotex, well, like I said, there's at the moment it, it appears that the the young South Australian fellas um, uh, moved quite, quite a, a fair way away from Mark Vickers. So, again, you, you put a gap on those machines and, and, and they're very, very hard to close. But, um, look, uh, let's just say, you know, there's a, there's, there's a few different parties going on, but they're all having a bit of fun amongst <laughs> each other. Well, different parties at different venues. Different, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because well, they're all split up, that's well, all. Well, you've got, you know, you've got Fuchs and Robin. Well, You've Robin's actually Cam- starting to break away from Fox a little a bit. bit, a little bit. Um, you know, you got Campbell and and um, and, and Cogger having a. I notice they have a sneaky look over at each other when they're running side by side down uh, the straight as well. Well, you've got a little bit of time to have a look, and 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 look, they rely. The one two fives uh, rely a lot on on uh, slip streaming. So even if you're, you know, a few meters back. And you 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 pick up a slipstream off the guy in front, and it, you'll get a bit of a slingshot. But well, they're just out on their sixth lap now. Well, they've got they've got um, they've got a few more laps up their sleeve. I, I'm not sure we're going to see too many changes. I think Nick Nick's definitely uh, yeah. He's out to 1.8 yeah, seconds now. Yeah, he's he's basically kind of broken away now. Are these carts hard to maintain consistent lap times? Are they... The the consistency of the lap time really is a byproduct of who's driving it. And you've only got to look at young fellas like Nick who are um, incredibly consistent. And that's probably the mark of a, a, a good driver. Um, I, I'm not current with the, the other lap times, but the others are, are not too bad. Um, Look, we need to disclose too that Nick's probably the youngest in the group. Mm. Um, he's, he's he's on the way up. You is that what well, you're saying? Well, he's only 20 years <laughs> old, so you know. Um, and really switched on, I must say. He's, 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 he's almost well, not almost. He's he's roughly half half the age of the others. So um, there's been yeah. a change of position here. The 91. That's. Uh, well, that, you've got a non-gearbox and a and stock Honda there. Yeah, which is gearboxed. Uh, which is gearboxed. So, um, is there an? Do you equate? What do you equate that to? That a non-gearbox uh, car can get a past a gearbox. Well, one? look. Without trying they're, to. They're, they're look. The stock Hondas are probably. They're, they're obviously a little bit gappy at the moment. Mm. Um, uh, young. Young uh, number number four, no, sorry, fourteen. That's Rose, isn't it? Rosie's. Yeah. Um, he's. I think he's the quicker, the quicker of the group. He has, I think, been pretty much the stock Honda front runner. Yes. All weekend. And see so that you've got a gaggle of hot stock Hondas in amongst the non gearbox, so they're chasing them down. And the difference between Rotex Light and Rotex Heavy is just the weight, obviously. No just other difference. the weight. There's about... Uh, look, That's with, uh, with driver in cart. Yeah, when you... Yeah, the class, the minimum weights, there's about, uh, I think from memory, there's about 10, 10, if not even 15 kilos difference between the, the lights and the heavies. Well, there's one of the others pulled That's up. That's the... Uh, Nick Marshall... That's Nick. a Rotex light. That's a, no, he'll Rotex be a Rotex heavy, heavy. Sorry, he'll be a Rotex yeah. heavy. I knew it was one or the other. Yeah, oh, <laughs> I, yeah, they're hard to tell. They really are hard to tell. Yeah. Handy, handy that he's right next to the Portaloo in case he needs to go there. Yeah. Um, look, it appears obvious. Nick's now. Nick's done the done. Look, he's 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 driven away. Oh. oh. 
Young Dylan, we might get a... We Stephen's might. off and out Dylan. of the cart, so he's... He's out, so... He's, where's he at? He's up at um, turn nine. That's, that, no, is it turn nine? Yep. I think that's just on approach to turn two. No. No. Hard to tell with the camera angle because you don't... Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's up the top part of the track. And, yeah, it's out between nine and ten. Nine and... Yes. Yeah. So, so now Nick, Nick, Nick's broken away now, so he's 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 clear. He can sort of coast to the finish now. Easy to understand why he is the Australian 125 gearbox champion. Well, I've always maintained, you know, these any any of them they're not there by chance. They're yeah. there they're there through a range of of, of uh, circumstances, and it's generally largely due to their talent as well. Good dice going on back here for some of the Honda, road. We've got a stock Honda and a non-gearbox having a go at one another. So that's the uh, Jock Dos Santos. Jock Dos Santos and uh, 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 Stuart Robinson, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, you're quite correct. Different carts. Um, yes, non-gearbox and... Uh, Stock on and but, uh, different chassis as well, arrow and very, very. Are uh, they much different underneath? Uh, well, like they are. Anderson? One one's got four wheel disc brakes and the other one's only got brakes on the rear. Um, no. Oh, there's yeah, Paul Campbell going Campbell's through gone wide. In a little bit too hard. He's he's probably. And we, that's allowed Aaron Cogger to go through on him. And it'll be hard. Oh, and and Laurie Fuchs got through on ropes. Mark Robin, so. I thought Raven was pulling away with that one. Well, it looked that way. It looked that way uh, on the screen, but you never know. Yeah. You, you never know. I see that uh, Fuchs's car. That uh, they're the wing ends that are. Yeah, they reckon they're pretty good for braking. They stabilise the car a bit, but I don't know if that's stabilising the car much well, by the amount of they need, movement. Yeah, they need a top top bar to keep them keep them keep from stable. Yeah, from uh, they. But you might notice that Shembury's don't move at all. No, because they're, well, that's correct, but if you have a good close look at Shimbries, you'll note that they're, they're braced nearly yeah. all the way up the top. Well, it will be interesting to see if Mark gets through. He's a, he's a, well, actually both of them are sort of persistent sort of characters, so um, it'll be interesting to see what comes of it. Well, this is the battle for third and fourth position. Shembury and Bella have gone through to start the last lap. So being the trophy race, this is the one you want to win for that uh, little bit of plastic that you uh, strive that look, so hard yes, to get. Yes, yes. Oh, it looks like... Oh, no, no. Jeez, that was uh, <laughs> cleverly done. They won <laughs> either, one either side. side. I wonder if he even knew about it <laughs> until they got there. No, he wouldn't have. He wouldn't have. <laughs> and here, Robin tries to get in the inside of Fuchs at turn two. Not quite close enough. But this is going to go all the way to the wire. Oh, isn't they'll it? they'll biff it out all the way. Um, <laughs> Don't say there'll be, <laughs> there'll be a little there'll be a little bit of tactics involved. And uh, look, credit to them, they're doing great. They're going great guns. So um, our race leader Nick Shembury should be. He's quite a bit in front of these. About 22 seconds up the road from where these guys are. He should be up towards the top of the track almost by now, on the way to his fourth victory be, for the he'll weekend. He'll be on his way shortly. Well, these two are having a great dice, which is great. Um, it'll be interesting to see. I mean, I know, I know, Robes all is our uh, race leader coming through there he goes. the top of the circuit for the last time. You've got to put your hands together for the do, the job that he's done. Four race starts in all sorts of different weather conditions, and he's come away with four oh, wins this weekend. He's done a terrific job, Nick. Nick, he's done a terrific job. That's Nick Shremby first. So we've got Vella. That's his best result for the weekend, the second. Best result, yep. Um, and oh, the... Robin got him. There you go. <laughs> so Persistent. We, yeah, we didn't see where that must have happened at turn eight. And Robin will cross the line in third spot. He is, he's going to get a bit of a toe here just to help slingshot his way to make sure that Fuchs doesn't get him back. Fuchs will go right over the other side of the track oh. and try and beat him. And look, and Cogger will just... Will he hold off Campbell? He has. It was. Uh, I've got to say, it was. I'm. I'm really pleased for both Mark and Laurie. They. Um, they put a lot of time into it, and uh, to have a, a good. That was a good race for them. 
Um, probably almost as good as winning. Yeah. And the next one across the line should be Robert Trimmer ahead of Adam Stewart. Tweedon in the Rotex will No, come we in. had, um, I think we had Co- Aaron Cogger and Paul Campbell. Um, yeah, we called them. We called them, okay. Yep. Then Trimmer was next, then it will be Adam Stewart, and then Tweedon in the Rotex will he, be the first of the... He's done a terrific job. Yeah, in the, and ahead of Strand. Yeah. And then the Vickers, uh, Rose, Santos, etc. are all a lap down. Well, thanks for everything, John. It's been fantastic having you you here, giving us some great insight in supercarts. I hope to catch up with you at future meetings. Whenever you're ready.